Yeah, so um, I've had the, the great opportunity to be able to see a company go from very small um, pre-production uh, release out through the process of, of you know product market fit and and, um, and and getting to IPO. And so along that along that pathway, um, we've seen a ton of scale and a, a ton of um, you know being a security company, a ton of different issues in the security space. And so um, when in talking with with Dan and Jonathan about what, what we could bring to the table here, um, I thought that I'd basically you know, take some of the stuff that we're doing in security that's specific to Java, given that, that what we do is basically um, we're pretty much a, a full Java uh, company, and dive into a few of the, those things that, we, that we've done and learned in practice and just kind of share it with you guys. So I guess this is kind of a combination of um, going into some of the Java security space as well as it's a how we do stuff. And so we'd also welcome dialogue and feedback as well as questions um, if people have those. Um, just, I'm not going to do a sales pitch, but just to give you a little bit of context about Okta, we've got like thousands of, of customer. Oh no, it's getting cut off at the top. <laughs> Alrighty, perfect. Yeah, so we have lots of customers, probably brands that you recognize. Um, we have you know verticals in finance and government that are very compliance heavy. Um, our product is used by tens of millions of people every day, um, not just to authenticate into their applications, which was our initial product for doing single sign-on, but now at this point we also um, do what we call API access management, which is basically OAuth as a service um, for for. Uh, um, companies, we also can offer a similar product to if you're trying to do something like what accounts.google.com does for Google, where they have a bunch of different web properties and you're trying to have a central IDP within your own system and then have a bunch of different applications that um, uh, basically feed back to that, that IDP, we offer that kind of functionality. Um, for developers, uh, if you're trying to build an authentication experience, we also have an out of the box, whether you want uh, it built into your application or fully hosted um, sign-on experience. And so, you know, when you dig into sign-on, you might be like, why don't I just use Spring Security or something like that, right? I'm just gonna be hashing some passwords and checking them against the database. Well, you know, when you get into the details, there's always a lot more complexity when you're trying to do account recovery flows, um, is that going to go over email or SMS? And if you're doing one of those, then do you have multi-provider? Like, what's going to happen if, if one of your SMS providers goes down? Um, in addition to that, if you want to have support for multi-factor, that's we handle all that kind of stuff. So all that complexity is, is um, taken care of. And just as an example, um, Adobe Creative Cloud actually behind the scenes is using Okta to authenticate their, their business customers. So um, we're using a bunch of places where you might not even be aware of it. So, like I was saying, I'm just going to talk about a few different things, like how we're, we're approaching security at Okta, and these are the, the three areas that I wanted to dig into. Um, TLS, how we do uh, security patching, and cryptography. And again, you know, there's a lot of details that are outside of the Java space, right, other layers of the stack, um, but I'm just going to really focus on the application layer and, and, and Java for the most part. So, uh, let's start with TLS. And, um, you know, just at a high level, why are we talking about TLS? Why do we use TLS in practice? Um, typically, we're trying to get um, these properties. Uh, authenticity, most commonly for the server. Do you know that you're actually talking and providing data and information to a server that you should you, you trust? Um, sometimes in scenarios uh, at Okta, we also have... Um, cases where we are authenticating the client. So um, TLS supports both client and server authentication. Um, integrity, ensuring that your messages aren't being modified, and of course, um, confidentiality, the fact that no one can read those messages that are being sent over the wire. So um, raise your hand if you work on an architecture uh, if that looks something like this. Okay, awesome. And just out of curiosity, um, how many of you uh, are terminating TLS, you know, outside of Java, up somewhere up the stack? Okay, and then how many of you um, might have requirements where you actually need to have uh, some form of confidentiality all the way through the stack, whether it's TLS or IPsec or something like that? 
Okay, so yeah, Okta is in the same boat. We have to uh, comply with FedRAMP requirements, um, which means that we need to have uh, com confidentiality across um, all of our, our internal connections as well. Um, but this is really only one aspect of TLS. And so if, if you're in this bucket, you might be wondering, like, why do I care about talking about TLS in Java if I'm not doing it in Java? Well, you're probably doing something like this. So raise your hand if you're in this category. Your, your service talks somewhere on the internet. Okay, right? So now it's starting to get relevant. Like, if you're, if you're using Java for outbound TLS connections, um, there's still things you need to be doing to manage that TLS and make sure that it's staying secure. Um, and then the last one, I'm just curious to see, um, are, are folks using uh, mutual TLS internally for server, server communication? Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, we, we are. Um, cool. So uh, that's useful just to get a sense from, from the audience, but it looks like there's a fair number of people that are using TLS and Java inbound, um, and a lot of people obviously using it outbound. So. Um, managing TLS is hard, and if you need good evidence of that, go run the Qualys scanner on one of the endpoints that you're managing, and then um, go run it again after a year and of doing nothing, and you're going to see that your rating has gone down substantially, and it's because there's constantly changes and vulnerabilities that need to get patched. And yet it's very common that we're writing our applications and we're not really thinking about um, or, or even exposed to the details that we would need to be exposed to to be able to actually manage this kind of stuff within Java. So one more background item um, for those you know familiar with the, the standard um, network layering. When we're talking about TLS in the TCP IP model, we're talking about the application layer. If you're in the more granular OSI model, we're talking about the session um, layer on, on top of which protocols like HTTPS um, take advantage of TLS. Um, raise your hand if, you've, if you feel like you'd be able to fairly decently explain the TLS handshake. I'm not going to ask you to do it. I'm just curious. Okay. Cool. Okay. Mike, yeah, go for it. Um, no, so we won't go into the details, but I think there's just a couple high-level takeaways. One is that you're doing two round trips. Um, on top of the, the initial TCP connection that you're establishing, you're doing an additional two round trips. The first one establishing a cipher suite and, a, and, um, and, and then um, authenticating the server when the server sends back its certificate and then um, finalizing with um, a key agreement. So um, there's a lot of stuff going on in here and yet when we go write our Java applications to connect to uh, TLS services, it might be something as simple as this. So this is an example of just calling out to some financial web service um, that provides stock quotes, and we're just using Spring REST template um, to, to make a call and get back some quote data. So if we were to run this program, um, you get some output like this, you know, whatever the, the format of the data is. This is like, I hope no one here wrote this, but like, man, that's some interesting JSON. Um, but, but, but anyway, like, What's, what's going on here, right? So like we wrote two lines of code and all this stuff we've been talking about, um, authenticity and confidentiality, we, we didn't have to configure anything. And so what I wanted to do is just dig in a little bit deeper um, and, and see like where is all this stuff coming from? So let's hop in the IDE. And please tell me if you can't see this in the back. Is this, you want me to zoom just a little bit more? Okay. This is really just the code we, we just saw. Uh, okay. Right, so we're basically just making a very simple call here um, to that REST endpoint. Let's, let's run this code, and of course I forgot to connect to my phone. Um, so, let's see. This takes, oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. This is actually probably more reliable. Uh, all right, yay! So let's dig in. Um, so what I did here is, uh, you know, you can pass a property to Java um, 
to enter Java debug mode, and then you can pass it any number of um, scopes, but I'm, I'm basically debugging SSL here uh, with, with this parameter. And so let's take a look at what's going on. Um, so when you start up your application, there's some system TLS settings that get initiated, right? And we're seeing that the first thing it's doing is it's basically figuring out what cipher suites are going to be supported um, by, by the, the runtime environment. And then the next thing that's pretty key is that we're loading this trust store. And so raise your hand if you knew about the CA search file that lives inside, you know, lib security. Cool. All right. So I'm not, I'm not telling you anything new um, for, for most people. But this is basically our root of trust of knowing where all of the, the root certificates for the connections that we're going to be making to outbound, um, whether or not our, our uh, runtime should, should trust them. Um, and then if we keep going down through here, you then see that it starts adding those um, trusted roots. And there's a lot of them. And then we get to um, initializing. Let's see, where is it? Uh, then we, we see this line here about key store. And so um, one, one fundamental concept to understand is that Java has this concept of a trust store and a key store. And unfortunately, the term key store kind of is con conflated in the fact that there's also a key store file format, and then there's the key store concept, um, which is used to contain your private key material if you're um, going to be making outbound um, connections and you want to validate the client. So the main takeaway here is just that trust store is for um, essentially CA certificates, no private key material, but just um, your, your root of trust for basic outbound TLS connections, and key store is about being able to authenticate you to the server. In this case, there's none provided by default, so it's not loading any of those. So if I were to have gone and navigated to this site, and it required, during the, the TLS exchange, if it required the client to provide a particular certificate, it would have sent a set of um, CNs that would be acceptable in a subject name, and it would try to go through this key store and find one that matches. I don't have any, so I would just fail. Um, and so then we see that we basically are starting uh, the, the, the TLS handshake to go do this request that we're trying to make. I'm not going to get into too much detail, but I do want to just go through this piece, which when you're troubleshooting TLS, um, this is a pretty common place to dig into, um, which is looking at how the cert chain validation is actually happening. So we're trying to talk to alphavantage.co, and the server um, is sending back during the handshake this, this certificate chain. And the first element in the chain matches the domain that we're trying to access. So during the evaluation process, thumbs up on, on host name validation. It's then going to go and look at who issued this certificate. In this case, it's Let's Encrypt. And hopefully, we can find a path to the root certificates that are in that trust store. So let's, let's continue down and see if we get that path. Sure enough, the, the next thing in this chain is the certificate that issued the previous certificate. And then this one is issued by DST root CAX3. And so now, it's th those were the only two in the chain. So it's up to the JVM to decide now, OK, can I find a path to one of those um, trust store CA certs? And, and sure enough, the, the root CA was in that trust store. So it says it found a trusted certificate, and it moves on. So I just want to go into this level of detail because essentially, you know, when you're writing just a couple lines of code, it's, it may not be clear where your root of trust is coming from. And so now we've dug into both how you could troubleshoot the TLS handshake as well as um, how you can understand where to go find that, that root of trust and, and see if there's any problems um, that you might need to, to dig into. So let's do a poll of the audience. If I modify this code to do a subsequent request to the exact same URL endpoint to grab the same data, am I going to do another TLS handshake? Raise your hand if you think, yes, I am going to do another TLS handshake. 
Okay, raise your hand if you don't think. Okay, so there's a lot of people who just don't want to raise their hands. That's cool. Um, let's, let's find out. Okay, so this is the second log line printing from the second call that we made. Let's go up to the first log line. And so essentially everything after this point is um, for the second request. As we see, there was, there was a client cached where we cached this session and we had already you know, negotiated this particular Cypher suite with the server and so we're, we're going to go try and resume it. But then we find that we essentially get to a place where we invalidate and end up kicking off another evaluation of the, the certificates coming from the server and another handshake. And it goes through all that same process that we just did. And so naively, if you're on the website looking at how to do some REST calls and maybe you're building an SDK where you're gonna loop over a whole bunch of calls out to this API endpoint, and now we've established the fact that a TLS handshake is gonna add an extra two round trips, um, you've just got a lot of performance overhead that you've added to your application that's unnecessary. So let's look and see if there's a way that we can solve this problem. And this is an example where we're using REST template, but we're passing in a different HTTP request factory. And so the, the default request factory has a set of settings that essentially, um, do, they do try to do um, session resumption, but they don't do um, connection persistence. And so they don't keep the connection open. It closed the socket, and so that's why we ended up, uh, it, we failed to resume the session, and so it then had to do another TLS handshake. In, in this case, what we're doing is we're basically telling REST template, instead, go use HTTP client and use its default setting. So this is the Apache HTTP client. And it turns out Apache HTTP client default settings are to use persistent connections. And so when we run the same scenario, we're going to see really quickly that essentially we get the second call for free without doing that TLS round trip. So the, the message about this is just that there are, the devil is in the details and it's important to understand those details or your application is doing a lot more work than it needs to do, right? It, I'm sure you could get REST template with its defaults to, to you know, potentially configure it in a way where it also has persistent connections. I haven't actually dug into that. I'm more familiar with HTTP client. But the, the point is that you just need to, to take a look at this kind of stuff and using the um, built-in debug functionality in Java is really useful for that sort of thing. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to dig into real quick is that when we were walking through that output, um, we saw this line that, that pointed at the CA search that a lot of people are familiar with. So if, if we want to go dig into that thing and see like what's in it, what's the structure of it, um, there's this tool part of the JDK called key tool. Um, raise your hand if you've used this tool before. Yeah. Raise your hand if you can remember how to do any of the commands without looking it up. Okay. Yeah, I like always have to go to this page. Oh, really? Oh, awesome. That's awesome. Um, yes. Respect. <laughs> um, so this is a, a key tool list. Um, this might be the only one I, I would remember how to do. Um, but essentially what we're seeing here is that there's, there's all those root CAs that got loaded when we were loading the application. They're in that CA search file. Not surprising. Here's an interesting bit. This is the entry type. Um, and in this particular case, it's an entry type of trusted cert uh, entry. And so you might wonder, well, what other types of entries can go into a, a JKS file? And, um, and what are the different properties? Because maybe you know, for a trusted certificate entry, in the case of a CA search file, there's actually no private key material. There's no reason to be encrypting that because it's just, um, it's just public keys. Uh, 
On the flip side, there's still a security vector, which is you don't want anyone to be able to modify that and slip trust into your system that, that um, you, you don't want to be there. So there's still, there's still some things to be aware of in, in securing that, but it doesn't have prim private key material. The other two uh, entry types, um, private key entry is um, for uh, asymmetric key pairs where, where you have your private key and then you also have the corresponding certificate that you'd be using for either mutual TLS or whatever other use cases you might have. So in that key store scenario, when we were saying there's trust stores and there's key stores, the key store would be comprised of private key entries. And then the last entry type is a secret key entry, which is basically just any type of secret material that implements the secret key um, uh, interface within Java um, can, can go into a key store as well. And um, for the two, the top two that have private key information, um, the, the key store file format, if you're using the Sun native one, does provide some level of encryption based on the passphrase. Um, it's using triple DES, uh, at least last time I checked in uh, Java 7, so maybe it's changed in Java 8. Um, but it might be something you want to dig into if triple DES is not um, good enough for your requirements. So on, on this topic of TLS, um, just a few takeaways. Uh, we, we dug into how to debug a TLS handshake, difference between trust store and key store, um, persistent connections and, and caching concerns. And I'm realizing there's two more things we, we, can, we can talk about real quickly. The first one is revocation checking. And so when we were talking about that cert validation process, we talked about following the chain. But that's really only one small part of validating trust in, in PKI, right? And so especially if you're using mutual TLS internally where maybe you're running your own PKI or your own CA, you now get into this scenario where it's like, well, if an operator leaves who had access to private key material, how are we going to revoke the certificates that they had access to? And now you actually do have to start thinking about certificate revocation. And so, you know, in, in our case, um, we've, we've had to augment our clients to, to use um, the, the PKIX um, uh, cert validation mechanisms for CRL. Um, you can decide which, which mechanisms you want, but the main point is that you're not getting this for free. So once again, in those like two lines, you're not going to get that um, if you are trying to rely on having uh, deeper OCSP or CRL verification. You, you don't get that out of the box. Certificate pinning. Certificate pinning. Yep. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I, I won't even get into it. We do a lot of things with regards to certificate pinning. Um, and then there's one last thing I wanted to dig into, which is actually a pretty important scale thing for, for us at Okta. Um, so, Everything we've been talking about thus far is about how you, how you bootstrap the system trust store and key store. And now let's say that you've got an application that's got millions and millions of uh, transactions flowing through it. And you want to make a change to your TLS posture. How do you do that in code that you can turn on and off at runtime? If, if, you're, if you're doing this with just the files that are down on disk, it's kind of hard. Maybe you, if you have a good canary system, you could put a canary out there. But if, if you want to do something even more dynamic than that, um, then, then SSL context is your friend. And, and this is an example of extending the, uh, the one from before this with providing our own custom SSL context. And here, um, you see that we're providing it both a key store and a trust store. And I happen to choose a file, but this could be something that you're storing in a database or um, some, some other storage mechanism. And so this right here gives you the ability to dynamically decide what you want. And so I'll give you some use cases where that comes in handy. If you're building a multi-tenant system that needs to do mutual TLS, you don't really want your key store for client authentication to contain the secrets from your other tenants. Because when they're doing that, um, uh, when, it's, when the TLS handshake is happening and the, the server is requesting a client certificate, it may return the wrong one. As long as it matches the requested common name in the subject, it's going gonna, it's gonna to return an identity. And it might return the wrong one. Um, another example is that if you're, again, doing kind of MTLS internally, but um, 
you also have clients that are going outbound, you might want to just from a security boundary perspective, segment your clients in, in this way and have a different um, key store or trust store for those two different boundaries. So this is something that's that's been very useful for our ability to, to um, change things on the fly. And then the last thing is you can also augment your cipher suites here as well. So if you wanted to dynamically try deprecating a cipher suite, um, you could do it do that with this method. Okay, that's it on TLS. Any any questions so far? No, it's, yeah. it's bootstrapping that means if you're fetching your trust store from somewhere, well you're bootstrapping your SSL context, how do you know it wasn't day one? Yeah, so um, I guess you need authentic authenticity from wherever you're getting it bootstrapped from and yeah, there could be a chicken and egg problem if what you're trying to do is to go out over TLS. Um, one, one method that we use is that we, we have our own CA and we have an offline root certificate. And so we, we place that root certificate on all of our infrastructure and um, that doesn't require any private material to be out on those boxes, but it gives us our root of trust where we can then be assured that we're talking to something that's Okta and only Okta. So then if there was a, like a key rotation failure, it would just fail to start rather than... Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk about patching. Again, there's a, we do a lot more with patching at other layers of the stack, so this is going to be fairly fairly light. I'm just going to talk about patching at the application layer with Java. And so there's really kind of two things. There's like patching Java itself, and then there's patching dependencies that you might depend on, um, whether you're using Maven or whatever your dependency management system is. And so when we're thinking about patching, it's like typically these are changes that you're, you're required to make to address some kind of vulnerability, right? So when you think about it, you're not changing any of your business logic, but you're, you're being forced to take on a bunch of risk because you're going to have to go apply this patch, which may also include some other changes. Um, and so when we, when we think about patching, I think a lot about how are we mitigating that risk and, and how do we build a system that allows us to roll out the patches quickly but know that we're not breaking anything along, along the way. Um, and so... David mentioned that he works on, on our distributed CI um, system at Okta, but we've put a lot of investment into our ability to take CI jobs for different artifacts and spread out the um, actual execution of their test environments across many containers um, in ECS and Amazon. Um, we, we do a standard um, dev test uh, prod release cycle, but we have a preview environment that always has code living in it for a week before it goes to production. And we actually have customers who are setting up their own synthetic transactions or development environments pointing at, at that environment. So essentially there's a week of time that they get um, where we're also getting real traffic that we can see um, <coughs> if people are running into issues. And then probably the two most critical things are we're always trying to figure out how can we take something that we need to roll out and put it behind a feature flag. So, so uh, back on this other topic of how do we do the TLS changes, how do you get um, things behind a, a code switch? And then if that fails, the last option is, is the Canary model where we release one or a, a small subset of servers with our change and look at metrics. So as Dan already mentioned, um, this is the new... The new norm in Java, this is our new versioning scheme. Um, and our strategy has basically been to stay on, on the long-term stable versions of Java. Um, certainly smaller projects um, may be able to go and keep up with the cadence of the, the shorter term uh, versions. But the, of course the problem here is that when you, when nine um, gets, uh, or when 10 comes out, nine's like immediately deprecated. So you don't, you don't have a, a long time window to, to be able to go and um, make that, that rollout happen and mitigate that risk. So for our, our large code bases, our strategy is to go um, with the long-term stable versions. And when we roll out uh, the, the JVM, we typically roll with a canary model because there, like, there's no way you can feature flag because it's the actual runtime environment. Um, and we find we've we've found all kinds of different issues along the way. Um, 
one common one is somehow in, in some library, someone will take advantage of something, uh, like say the ordering properties of a, of a data structure that shouldn't be ordered like a set or a map, and then you find that when you go from Java 7 to 8, that the um, deterministic but different ordering throws off something in, in the system. Um, like for example, how Spring processes processes the dependencies as it's loading up the application context, and you might find spring cycles, and you may find them only in production um, depending on, on how your build system is set up. So that, that was an interesting one. Um, this is an example of some of the data that we're looking at when we're running our canaries. Um, so, you know, canary isn't useful unless you actually have success criteria for knowing whether or not the canary actually is working. In addition to essentially assuring that we're not having any errors. Um, we're also looking at performance profiles, both at the JVM layer and the host layer. So we talked about upgrading Java. Now let's talk about like upgrading libraries. Um, so again, how do we, like if, if we're trying to make the most dynamic way that we can control making changes, how do we feature flag a library upgrade? And a common one might be like Bouncy Castle or um, you know, Open SAML library. These are like super critical libraries for our product. And it would be devastating if you upgraded a crypto library, it had a different format for the data that's getting persisted. And then when you go roll back, now you've got this mixture of potentially corrupt data in your database. So you really want to be slow and methodical about your rollout with this and be able to control it. And so we don't do this everywhere, but in places where we really need to, to mitigate risk, um, we take a strategy of essentially having two versions of the same code on the class path. And Maven, uh, the Maven Shade plugin provides one option for repackaging. Um, I know there are others. Um, but this has been a strategy that we've used, uh, again, to be able to go and, and slow roll a change, where essentially you can bring uh, two versions of the code into the class path, and then yes, you do have to go into your code and put the right introspection points where you can feature flag switch from one to the other. Um, and so it, it helps if you've done a good job of kind of encapsulating the libraries that you're using. But this is, this is definitely a strategy that we use um, as well. Okay. The last topic I'm going to touch on is um, encryption and uh, basically symmetric encryption at Okta. And to roll back um, to about five years ago, we had this problem which was we, we wanted to have a strong root of trust um, with any of, the, any of the crypto keys that we're using to decrypt our customers' confidential data and their credentials. And, but we also wanted to be able to auto-scale our machines. And you have this problem where it's, it's, you need some place to be able to have those keys provided. And so maybe that's a key server, maybe that's having operators provide the bootstrap keys at startup time, which was the model that we had. We were going down the path of looking at using an HSM, and then we're very fortunate that, that Amazon came out with KMS right around that time because HSM would have been a much harder implementation um, from a scale perspective. But so then when we dug into KMS, there was this other problem, which is that now you're literally putting like the crown jewels of our, our system in, in the hands of a third party where if they had data corruption or an outage, we literally just can't even operate. So we needed to have a better HA story and we also wanted to have um, a DR story. And so this was the design that we came up with. And the, the first element is that we had to create a key hierarchy. So it meant that if you use KMS natively, what you're doing is you're going out to KMS to get data keys that are encrypted by the key that lives inside KMS that no one can see or extract. And those data keys encrypt your data. And the problem is, if you move um, to a different KMS, the keys that have encrypted your data um, don't have a root of trust in that other KMS. So what we had to do is essentially create one layer of hierarchy where the keys that we're using to encrypt our data are stored in our database, encrypted with each of the roots of trust that we have. So for each tenant, we have a master key. And that master key is encrypted by KMS in the east, 
KMS in the West Coast, and then with an RSA public key. And this was our break glass um, ability to also not be vendor locked into Amazon. And what we do in the RSA uh, case is we only push the public keys out to our infrastructure. Because you know, with asymmetric crypto, you need the public key to do encryption, and you need the private key to do decryption. So we don't put the private key out in production. It's, it's locked in a safe. The public key is out on all the machines, so when we create new tenants, we're able to encrypt their tenant master key and store that down in the database. And if we needed to, we could pull out that RSA private key and decrypt their data if there was a catastrophic issue with KMS. And sure enough, like three, three months after we rolled this out, there was a catastrophic issue with KMS in the East Coast. And it went down. They called it an increased error rate. But um, you know, it's basically an outage for a little over an hour. And this was what we saw in, in our monitoring. We saw you know, trying a KMS decrypt operation on the East Coast and then failing over to the West Coast. Um, and so no operators had to wake up in the middle of the night. Basically, this is all done in, in code, and we, we self-healed after, after um, KMS was back up in the east. And KMS has had, I think, one other outage um, after this as well. Um, so we're, we're pretty happy with the HA story around that. Um, but there's another thing that was that, that was pretty important to us, which is if if your whole goal is to get to the state where you've got auto scaling and you've got you know new servers coming up in in and being able to get cryptographic keys, you need to have um, assurance that there's no way that a malicious actor could also emulate being a new server coming up into existence and um, and starting to do decrypt operations that you don't want them to do. So we we dug into what kind of auditing capabilities there were in KMS. And the first one is this encryption context. And this is actually, you know, so um, KMS uses AES GCM, which is an authenticated symmetric key encryption model. Um, and when you provide encryption context to KMS, it is actually placed into the, the authenticated data for that encrypted blob. And so you always have to provide that exact same encryption context. So encryption context is somewhat useful for, for um, building up an audit log. But for example, it wouldn't be something that you could put like a request ID, correlation ID, of, of something like that into, because you need to always supply precisely the same type of data there. So what we do is we put into an encryption context essentially data that identifies the type of thing that's being decrypted that's immutable. Things like its identifier and maybe its type. And then um, we use um, various other elements, in particular the user agent. So if you use the AWS SDK for KMS, they have an ability to append additional data to the user agent, and we use that to append on other correlation IDs that we can then correlate in our SOC to ensure that the decrypt operations that we're seeing from our application are also um, corresponding to things that we're seeing on the KMS side. When we rolled it out, uh, first we ran into a bunch of issues with just the matching. We actually hadn't been doing that user agent um, correlation ID thing at first, so we found a whole bunch of false positives. Um, then we also noticed that KMS actually does uh, audit literally every time they're doing internal um, key rotations and maintenance at AWS. So you also get those things flagged as well, which was pretty interesting. Last thing was, because we had this model where we were using an RSA key in addition to KMS, it allowed us to have a model that works both in development and also allowed for a slow rollout. So every one of our developers at Okta is actually using the RSA key pair for all of the crypto um, routes on their, on their laptop, so they don't actually have to have a KMS running. Um, and so then when we went to go roll this out, we slow rolled by going from a small percentage of people using KMS to more and more and more, and that's what this graph is showing. And then when we rolled it out, we realized, oh my god, we're doing way more requests to KMS than we were expecting. And later we learned that this is actually the biggest risk 
to using a third-party system for your crypto. And the issue is that if you hit your rate limit in AWS, it's game over. So even if you've done all this HA, if, if someone creates a new application that's not really good about caching or reducing its, its request to KMS down to a reasonable level, you can just completely take out both servers very quickly. We've never done it, but we saw that we were getting close with this and we had to invest a lot in our tuning to be able to get some amount of caching so that we can always have a dial to control the amount of times we're actually having to go back to KMS. Um, and part of, part of what makes this possible is using a key hierarchy. If you're not using a key hierarchy, but you're using KMS for literally every blob you have to go up to KMS, then it's kind of game over. So you have to kind of think about your performance trade-offs and your AWS limits when you're, when you're designing a system like this. <coughs> From a performance perspective, we noticed that Amazon um, typical response time was somewhere in the 50 to 60 um, millisecond time range with P99s above 100 milliseconds. So when you're trying to keep your actual application down below 300 millisecond response time, um, this is adding about a third uh, of the time in overhead. And so this was yet another driver for needing caching. So even if we hadn't found this rate limiting issue, we would have needed it for this, this problem as well. So we're amortizing the cost of, of our decryption lookups in KMS. This graph shows you um, what we observe in, in practice for error rate in KMS when we had first been rolling this out. And we noticed it was actually fairly high. So we just needed to do some, some fine tuning on the HTTP client to do some retries and it, it got down to a negligible level. So they, they seem to allow some normal amount of errors and you essentially as a, as a client need to be resilient to those. This was the tuning that we used, essentially three second timeouts and, and a max error retry of three. Um, they were, they were both, and I'd say probably were more timeouts. But we, we didn't want to have much higher than a three-second timeout for our own performance profile, especially when we're seeing that it's very rare that it happens. But yeah, that's a great, great question. Yeah. Right, right. But in, in our case, like retrying when you're, yeah, it, it, it gets tricky. Retrying when it, it's generally well below the, the threshold that you're at, what we've observed is that um, in, pra in practice that hasn't been an issue. So I guess it's basically been a tuning thing that we've approached as you just have to trial and error. Yeah. Um, so some takeaways on this, uh, if, if you're building a, a KMS strategy, and I don't mean just Amazon KMS, whatever cloud provider you're using, Vault, or wherever your, your root of trust is, if you have a key server, um, you know, it's, it's, that's great, but if you're not doing the auditing as well, then it's really hard to know whether or not um, there are bad actors. You, you just happen to have a system that's maybe more um, cloistered, but you still don't really know what's actually happening. So that, that was pretty important. Um, building redundancy into critical infrastructure as a service offerings is, is a big thing for us because um, they do have outages. And so as an example, in addition to KMS, um, we, we've, we've also started using CloudFront a number of years ago in S3 in our, in our critical flows in our application. And for both of those, we had to design a method where we could, on the CloudFront side, be able to turn off CloudFront if CloudFront wasn't working. And essentially, the way we do that is the, the initial application loads from our site. And because they have to go to our site once, we can then decide whether or not they're going to get routed with URIs that are going to point at our CDN distribution or whether they're going to get um, pointed at our, our servers directly. And on, on the S3 side, we've, we've um, not just used Amazon's redundancy within S3, but we actually have our client do dual writes and reads for supercritical S3 paths because we wanted to be both HA, not just for reads, which is what you would get for free if you use their functionality, but we also wanted to be HA for writes. So um, that, that's been a big, uh, big element. Um, 
caching and key hierarchies were really important for us um, for avoiding vendor lock-in and being able to slow roll out. Um, this is yet another tuner HTTP client. And lastly, um, those, those API limits are, are very scary. So uh, keep an eye out. With that, um, we are having a get together, uh, engineering um, happy hour. So if you didn't get enough beer tonight, um, come by our office tomorrow night. Um, there's a bit.ly link, tjug-octa18. Um, we'd love to have you guys come and meet the team and talk about what you guys are working on, um, as well as learn a little bit more if you're interested. Um, and our office is, is about, what, maybe 15, 20 minute walk from here. Um, and thank you so much to Dan and Jonathan for, for putting on this event and hosting, and, and for all of you for um, listening to me babble for a little bit. Um, that's my contact information. Thank you. Um, any questions? Yeah, as I just totally neglected to talk about that. Um, we have a team that does that. Uh, so we, we heavily use Maven, and they're, they're able to scan um, with Maven against uh, CV, RSS feed. Um, I actually don't know all the details, but I know that we get a lot of inbound tickets from them. Um, so there is a team that, that is actively monitoring. And, it, and it, I'd say that came when our engineering org was maybe 100 people. So there was definitely a, a fair amount of time as a startup where that was more of an internal best effort kind of thing. And then eventually we essentially cre created a red team where this was one of their responsibilities. Yeah. Um, is that stuff okay so you have a handle or you have like in my code execution or exploits on or like how does that work? Yeah, so if if like heart heartbleed or uh, you know the 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 one that was like uh, there've been XML DTD vulnerabilities that have come out that also allowed remote we don't use struts but like if something at that level is coming out yeah it might not be canary it might be just roll it out and like it's more important to ensure that our customer data is secure de depending on what's at risk. So yeah, we do a triage and, and analyze whether or not the, the thing that would be affected by that vulnerability actually applies to our system and then make a call. But in terms of like, like the rest of us who are not other people, is there anything out there that you're like monitoring all these other steps uh, essentially? Oh, I see. Um, may yeah, you know, there there are threads, and I'm just not, I'm probably not the best person to give you an answer on that. Um, I'd, I'd have to ask our team, but I, I know that part of it is there's literally someone looking at all of them and seeing what's been affected. I thought, though, that there's a startup that's trying to do this, in, and I think Java was one of the, the languages that they support. It's, it's you know, I don't know if... You, does anyone know about Black Duck and these other like compliance-related scanners? So I think um, I think there's a company that's trying to displace both Black Duck and also provide um, notifications. I, I can there try to look into it. There is a Maven plugin that does this. Like it's free. The WSO2 one, I think, which will scan your dependencies and tell you the uh, the volumes of those, which is you know keep it cheerful. <clears throat> yeah. And it might create a large, uh, a large noise factor that, yeah. that you have to deal with. Um, so, yeah, it's it's hard yeah, problem. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, we have someone who wrote a tool internally that allows us to diff our trust stores, um, and so we're. We also have to, we're an integration company, so we talk to thousands of different APIs. So what we do is we. Um, We've written a tool that will take, so we use App Dynamics and some other application monitoring tools that can tell us all of the outbound uh, domains that we're talking to. We can feed that into a tool. You can just write like a you know, 10 line Java loop that basically goes and establishes a TLS handshake with each one of those and gets back um, you know, essentially what, what root CAs they're using, what cipher suites they're supporting. So we kind of do that that pre-work of figuring out like 
okay, what do we think is going to happen when we roll this out? Um, and then, th then there's the risk mitigation stuff that kicks in after that. So that, that's been the approach. T to be honest, it's hard because like Komodo and like some of these other CAs that suck, like pe people still rely on them. Um, and, and so it, it, you know, we, we probably could even do more. We could be more dynamic with our trust store around only using it in the places that we need to. Um, you know, we, we, we strike a fine balance of, of being able to remove like egregiously bad um, trust store uh, or, or uh, root CAs. But, you know, it's hard. Maybe for most people it is still better to just try to stay on essentially the latest version of Java and rely on, on that ecosystem. I, I'm not an expert <laughs> on that. Um, we, I, I guess a different way of saying it is we should re we probably need to internally reevaluate whether or not we need to be on the Oracle JDK, but we're on the Oracle JDK. And we did that because it was a known quantity and we wanted to have consistency. Um, it was a while when the Open JDK didn't come with a trust story. Mm. Yeah, and I don't know what drove this, but also I think the latest version of the Java 8, like 162, comes now with the unlimited JCE inside the JVM, but you just have to switch it on rather than whatever crazy mechanism you've had to do with config management to be able to put that thing in place or invalidate your license agreement with Oracle, however you solve that problem. Um, yeah, so we're excited about that, but... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or, or know the right, I mean, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> anything else? All right. Thanks, guys. Great.